Welcome everyone. This is actually our fourth Knowledge Worker Innovation event in Boston. So today's topic is Big Data Innovation Trends in Education, MOOCs, Interactive Visualization and Analytics. We are fortunate to have Dr. Una May O'Reilly from MIT with us. Um, Una May is the leader of the AnyScale Learning for All, or Alpha, research group at MIT's Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence uh, Lab, CSEL. Una May is an, uh, an expert in scalable machine learning, evolutionary algorithm, and frameworks for large-scale knowledge mining, prediction, and analytics. She's the author of over 100 academic papers, and in 2013, Una May received the Evo Star Award for Outstanding Achievement in Evolutionary Computation in Europe. She um, is the Young Fellow in the International Society of Genetics and Evolutionary Computation, and she's the Area Editor for the Data Analytics and Knowledge Discovery for Genetic Programming and Evolve Machine, and, uh, and so on. I think I can go on for all of I should cut that short. Yeah. Uh, so today we're uh, going to be talking to Una, with Una May about a novel information model named MOOCDB, and overall the project that she's working on with her lab. And this MOOCDB model is a multi-institution collection of data from MOOCs. MOOCs are massive online courses that support multi-platform, open access, collaborative online education research. Uname will also talk about a number of projects that are spinning off as a result of this uh, uh, initiative, MOOCDB, um, the, the information model, and that enable um, in researchers and her group to provide interactive visualization and data analytics. So please welcome me, uh, well, join me in welcoming um, Dr. Uname O'Reilly. Uh, so let me start by thanking Mona for inviting me, and I'm very happy to be here in the Innovation District. And uh, today I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, a project called MOOCDB, which allows um, us to enable con collaborative online learning research. And the starting point is MOOCs, and, and Mona has mentioned them, so I think I may as well uh, ask you, how many people are familiar with MOOCs here? Can you raise your hand? Okay, not everyone, and ha has anyone actually taken one? Cool, okay. Well, what I'm showing you here is, is the uh, um, uh, landing, uh, one of the landing pages for a MOOC, right? Um, MOOCs are run, these massively open online courses are run on servers, on big clouds, and uh, you log into a MOOC platform, and you get an ID, and you use that every time you come back, c return to it to get content, and um, these, there's different platforms for providing MOOCs. Uh, the one you're looking at here is um, provided by edX, um, a consortium out of MIT and Harvard. And another popular one that you may have heard of is Coursera. Um, and what these platforms enable uh, universities to do is to uh, offer courses to anyone completely online at no cost. Right? And, uh, so uh, what you're seeing here is, is, uh, is a notion of what a student experiences when they take a MOOC. And I, it's a really different experience from learning in the classroom. I think that's the one thing to emphasize here is that the lectures are provided on video and every other educational resource is digitized. So you have uh, digital textbooks um, and uh, digitized uh, assessments and uh, even embedded tools for the particular subject matter. So if um, I'm gonna talk to you today about the data from a course in circuits and electronics. It's called 6002X from MIT. And there's actually a circuit simulator tool uh, within the MOOC. Um, and uh, the other thing, the other piece of a MOOC that you get is students don't really have the interaction they would have in the classroom. When they're online, they're, they're isolated from each other. But, but it's well known that this isolation can lead to students dropping out. So the, the, the loan mechanism that currently exists to support students' social structure is a discussion forum. And students can post uh, different uh, discussion threads and, and talk back and forth through that. So it's a completely different learning experience from the student's point of view. A student has this autonomy to set their own educational pace and to take their own path navigating through the educational content. And, uh, this means that there's a very personalized version. So imagine that you might uh, skip a video because you think you know that stuff, 
uh, charge forward and take an assessment and realize there's a deficit, go back and find the video that had the material. Or maybe you even watched that material, but you need to review a certain part of it. You have this complete freedom to go uh, back and forth um, and choose what resources you have. Um, uh, so what's really interesting is that uh, these platforms are running on the web, on, out on the internet, so we can collect all the data and we can actually study how students are learning with them. And that's really valuable for instructors to help us teach students better, but actually it's also valuable for learning science research. Um, and learning, research, learning science research has, has been taking place for, for, for eons, right? Um, but there's a different proposition here when one wants to study how students learn with MOOCs um, in contrast to residential courses because a learning scientist in a residential course has to go into the classroom and, and only looks at a small sample of people and it's a s simply an observation exercise and then there's access to you know, content and surveys with students and uh, you know, assessments uh, and all that is actually quite available on, on the MOOC platform but what you have in addition to that is this data trace, right? Because every time a student uh, logs in, uh, it's, he or she is identified and timestamped, and now every uh, click through the content can be recorded. So you have this very, very fine-grained, um, detailed record of someone's behavior when they went to learn. And I don't just have it for one person. You know, the first course that we, that we looked at had 120,000 students register for it. Now, only 7,000 people completed it, but still 7,000 students. I can watch how they learned with this data, and that's extremely valuable. We, we only teach 60 a year in this course at MIT, right? So think of the scaling. Uh, but the important thing now is how do we take on this enterprise of examining the data? You know, we're trying to look at this uh, process that spans integrating the data from multiple courses on multiple platforms all the way through to um, storing it, processing it, and then finally uh, deriving models from it that may be hypothesis driven, um, uh, oppositely doing data driven um, uh, insights, getting data driven insights, and producing visualizations that give us uh, some uh, information as, as to what's going on. And overarching this whole uh, process of of working with this MOOC data, we have to confront the privacy challenges. So what I have here is this sort of microcosm of a, a situation that many of you may face in the industrial world, right? That there, are, there is data out there. It's, um, uh, it may come from multiple sources. It may not be completely compatible, but there's value in integrating it. But now we have to un understand that technology stack from the point in which we touch the data initially to the, to the, right to the end point where we're actually deriving insights from it and we're, we're actually concerned about control and access to it for confidentiality and, and privacy regions, re reasons. So there's some challenges to resolve though if you want to do this data analysis and that's really uh, what I want to talk about today. As much as I tell you the value of clickstream data, what you, what you may understand is that it's extremely low level, right? <laughs> These are JSON logs that are posts and gets. Right? And they, they, they basically list a student ID, a timestamp, and a URL. Well, that information is so low level, it, it needs to be abstracted up to the notion of what a, an educational resource is. And we need to, and, and it's also flowing in on a timeline, right? It's just, you know, whatever happens, at, at, you know, uh, uh, second by second. But what we'd really like to be able to do is isolate a student and look at a student's time point through the, the course at that higher level. So that's one of the challenges that, that uh, one has to work on. Um, and so here's a picture of what the data looks like on the edX platform, just to give you a sense that there's multiple streams, not any, no stream is in the same format. There's SQL, there's no SQL. Um, there's all the traditional uh, data sources that you would recognize from uh, a brick and mortar course, but there tucked on the side are these server logs and browser logs uh, in JSON form. And if I look at the, uh, the particular course I'm going to show you today, you know, it's 60 gigabytes of data, modest somewhat, you know, but if I have 100 of these, it gets bigger. Um, but that's mostly the JSON logs. All right, and if we actually organize those and abstract those the right way, then the data really shrinks. And that means we can, you know, um, 
have a chance at resolving some of the other challenges that, that we face. And so one of those is that you know, once I get this data abstracted, I still want to look at it many times. Right? So I need to have um, an organization of it or an information model that allows my queries to be very efficient because I'm going to do them many times and they're going to be for lots of data. Right? I, have, uh, you know, I, have, I have records of doing these in the millions. So let's talk a little bit about the multiple platforms. I've told you about Coursera. I've told you about edX. And, and that's um, a headache, because just as I showed you the edX streams, it's different for Coursera. And ultimately, if we want to consider every MOOC that's given as an experimental data point, then we need to collect all those experimental data points across the world. You know, different learners from different cultures and different uh, native languages, and on different platforms. And so resolving. Uh, um, the differences between those platforms is really key to us getting at the uh, leveraging that data for the insights we need. And I, I think that might resonate with some of you here. Um, and a final challenge really is about data control. And uh, that's because uh, when the course is actually being uh, provided to the students, the platform provider is collecting all this data in these multiple streams and it's collected, it's distributed over the cloud. But once the uh, when, at, at the moment, once the course is over, this data is handed over to the institution, you know, like MIT, if MIT gave the course. But even at MIT, the control of that data is not completely resolved, right? It may go to the instructors first, and then it may pass to the institute res registrar. And then there's going to be access control given to researchers like me at MIT who want to look at it. And what about all those people outside in the world who want to look at that data? You know, and, 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 and putting uh, it another way, I'm at MIT and I'm looking at MIT data, I'd really like to look at Stanford data too, <laughs> right? I would. I, uh, and that's on a different platform, it, and we know that, we know it's in a different format, but the people at Stanford really can't give me a look at their data, right? The, the controllers of the data are in different silos. And the, question, the real challenge here is how we might, in an ecosystem, in a data, eco, in a data system, where, where we're starting from scratch, how do you do this right, right? Many of you are inheriting legacy problems, but I don't have any legacy problems. These MOOCs have been around for a very short time, and if I actually threw away all the data from the present back, I would still be getting 10 times that in the next year, right? So my data is only growing like this, so I can afford to make some of these decisions that you may not um, have the luxury of. Um, and so I need to come up with a solution that gets me around the fact that that data is in different silos, and actually I'm never going to see it, right? We're not going to take it and put it in one big thing, and we're not going to actually allow someone to come in and look at the different silos uh, for confidentiality concerns and for privacy concerns. So what we've done is we've uh, created in my group an information model or a data schema uh, that um, is uh, capable of expressing all the behavioral data inf that, that is, ex is um, exhausted from a MOOC platform. And this data or information model is high level um, that supports us making very um, uh, relevant queries about the data to find out about how students are learning. So we call that data model MOOCDB, um, and it is going to resolve those controller issues and I'll show you why. I mean, the, the, in a nutshell, it's that if everyone converts to their, their private data to the same data model, then they don't have to share data, but they can share software, right? Because the software that extracts data on one system will actually work to extract the same data on someone else's system. And then you can basically uh, have different controllers of the data do the same operations. So I'll show you a picture of that. Um, but uh, the, the low-level JSON logs are abstracted up to the notion of um, students and resources, uh, uh, motion, um, different modes of interaction with the platform when uh, data is being um, read or when data is actually being entered. So we have um, uh, these different modes defined in, in a set of tables, and uh, you get a picture like this. Uh, so here's my different platform providers, and they're, they're the primary aggregators of my data. And let's just assume that they are able to consolidate the data. Okay, so um, the data then moves over to the institution, um, and the institution now converts the data from its raw form to this data model 
this information we're talking about, the, the data model that we actually call MOOCDB, and it's, it's a definition, it's a set of tables, right? And uh, I'm gonna take you there and show it to you because it's documented. I put it out there in public for everyone to see. So now you can actually see what we've made public is the full definition of all the tables. So you get some information and you see the different modes and now anyone could come along um, and populate, repopulate their data according to this data model. But of course we don't make people do that. What I have is a team of students and what we've done is we've come up with a set of scripts that move you from the edX data to the MOOCDB data model. And now we're going about and for existing edX courses we're moving uh, some of those courses into the MOOCDB data model. Um, when we told people about the MOOCDB data model and our notion of control, Stanford came along and they had a course and they said, well, this makes sense. We, we have the same issue with our platform. You know, the data is low level and, and we know we need an, an information model. So why don't we use yours and work with you to make sure that everything that we're capturing out of our platform is sufficiently uh, expressed in this information model as well as yours. And let's actually come up with a very tight unification of the meaning of those fields. So we supported them to write their scripts to, um, uh, uh, to convert their data to also be in a MOOCDB information model. The result is something like this. All right, so um, when we're finished, um, there's a course at MIT called 6002X and it's in the database and it's got all these different tables and it's filled in with the um, student information and the observations and the submissions that all the students did in 6002X. And sitting over here at Stanford is a, another database that of course can't be seen from the people at MIT. Um, and uh, this database is called the Crypto One database because that's the course Stanford gave and it's got exactly the same tables. Right? And this is the point, because now if I um, go back here, uh, because all these two, because both these databases are using the same data model, anyone in the community, be, da be they data analysts or database experts or privacy experts, can now write SQL scripts you know, with accompanying um, analytics, and they can use it on their own database and make sure it works and get their results and then they can pass their SQL scripts to someone else who controls their data and that those people will do the extraction and get the analysis and come back and you'll be able to share the endpoint but not the source of the data. So that surmounts the, the control issue. So we did that and I just wanted to show you a picture of that because uh, once Stanford converted its database, you know, we just shipped our software over to them and boom, all of a sudden these two courses were now side by side and I'd actually gone to conferences where these kinds of visualizations were given by two different people in two different talks, right? And we really don't want to do that, right? That's not, the point is not that. So what you're seeing here is a, you know, it's a, a map that's, that highlights uh, uh, the uh, percentage of students from a country who gained a certificate relative to how many actually registered for the course. And you can see that the MIT course in circuits and systems was extremely popular in Europe. I think the high, um, uh, highest frequency of uh, certificate earners was Spain. Uh, but if you give a crypto course, it turns out that it's really popular in Asia and <laughs> Russia. Uh, go figure. And, um, uh, you know, so, so this is the sort of information that we can start to compare. And here's another example. The course at um, Stanford was only eight weeks and the MIT course was 13, right? So little apples to oranges. But what we can actually do is uh, for both courses, it's very simple to run a script that pulls out the uh, number of hits to the uh, server every day. So this is a timeline on your x-axis and that's the number of hits on your y-axis. And you see this sort of uh, sawtooth that's decreasing. So the reason it's decreasing um, is attrition. So it's happening in all MOOCs, not just the one on circuits and systems and crypto and not on one platform and not the other and not at one university's course and not the others. Um, but also the sawtooth is sort of repeated Anyone want to speculate what that is? That peak where things jump? It comes out on Monday. What's that? The class is on Monday. It's close. That's actually the night before the deadline of the assignments. <laughs> <laughs> right? And, and what you see is this universality of students starting their work you know, close to the deadline. So yeah, um, you know, there's just some commonalities. And, and, and uh, I'll show you one more. These are rather uh, shallow, I would say. Uh, one of my students tried to look at something new, which is to say, now that we've got this high level uh, information model, we can segment the group of students by their grade or by their country. 
Right? And once we uh, can segment them, let's say, by their grade, we can actually, for every student, we can take a look at which resource they were accessing and for how long. And then we can group the resources and say, well, how, long, how many times were they paying attention to the lecture? Um, how many times were they looking at a tutorial? Or different resources. And that's what you're seeing here. Um, you've got the uh, edX uh, uh, plots on the left, and you've got Coursera crypto uh, plots on the right. And actually, there's not a lot to be said about resource usage between grades, right? between A, Bs, and Cs and in, either, um, in either course. You know, I think that the ratios are slightly different, uh, and that sort of reflects the content. Uh, but we did then separate it by country instead. And we got what, we, what some people have been calling the India effect. So if you take a look at the Indian students, which is down here, they're just not watching the video. They're not, watching the, they're not paying attention to the lectures at all. And, and the question now is, 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 is for, for, for further research, is, is that a cultural thing? Um, is it a language barrier? Um, it's not, it remains to be ex uh, explained. But it's actually consistent across both Coursera and whatever, and uh, Coursera and the edX platform. So we got MOOCDB working, and we're evangelizing it, right? Uh, we put it out there on our website. We've got Coursera and edX. Uh, we're working with them to see if they'll support it, and uh, then, you know, then the data will actually arrive at the data controllers in the right format, information model. The idea, though, is that this information model is public and owned by the community, right? I mean, we kick it off, and we'll put a framework up there for everyone to share it. But as, uh, new, um, as new investigations are made, if the model is insufficient, then let's expand it, right? Um, it's just that it's going through an incubation period with these two large-scale provi large providers. Um, but we thought further about this, and it really goes back to this notion of data sharing through software. Well, so if you can data share through software, the other thing you can do is insight share. Right? You really do want to have a community of eyes around your data. Right? Um, and furthermore, you really don't want everyone writing the same software to do their analytics. Um, and if you're a scientist, you really don't want people to uh, uh, write their own software because then the variables get confused, right? Um, so if you want uh, all these things, what you, what, what's really needed is a framework for open sourcing uh, analytics for these MOOCs. And that's what we're building um, and from a foundation of all the data being in the same data format on MOOCDB. And we call that open source framework MOOCVIZ. And the way MOOCVIZ works is, you know, we sort of envision um, a population, uh, like the crowd, anybody who wants to comment on these analytics, and it could be instructors, it can be students, it can be, you know, armchair uh, teachers, anybody. Um, but they can go to a public access platform where there's a gallery of all these visualizations and analytics. And accompanying that platform of, uh, with the gallery and the analytics, we actually have a GitHub where all the software that generated the analytics is available for sharing. So my students are creating this gallery right now for us. Um, and the whole framework um, is actually going to allow you to create your own gallery. Um, because you can actually download templates for visualizations and analytics, and they handle all the um, uh, organization of your software so that there's an extraction part, there's an analytic part, and there's a visualization and a publication part to it. So this is just different students have actually set up different visualizations. And if you were to click on one of these visualizations, what you would get is uh, through a template. So you, know, you, get a, you, you, zoom, you, you get a page about this particular visualization. And, and here our student has sort of said, OK, it's this particular piece of data you're looking at. You can imagine many courses now being available here. And uh, there's a short description. And what we've done is we've set up a software pipeline. And you can click on different parts of this software pipeline. And each time you click on it, what happens is the code for that particular part, the extraction script here, is what we clicked on. You know, so you can actually get it. And you can now download or upload, if you want to contribute to the MOOCVIZ uh, project, um, all your source files. So my wrap up is to sort of tell you that the MOOC sphere is like a microcosm of uh, um, other data situations, but it's got this uh, luxury of starting from scratch. And uh, MOOCs are changing all the time. So uh, one has to set up frameworks that allow that evolution. And one has to, I believe that you have to democratize the whole information model and the whole uh, analytics. Um, so that when that growth happens, that there's a whole uh, dynamic community following it. Um, so with that, I guess I'll go over to Mona and, and tell you more.
so some of it, as um, your, your project is a microcosm of some of the problems many companies are thinking about around data. Um, so was actually interested in think in your training a lot of students in your lab, the Alpha Lab, um, and teaching them how to do this um, integration extraction to insights. And um, how much of that is transferable in, in other domain or, or, or how, how you're seeing commonality mm -hmm. through that work and other work you're doing in other domains? Well, so MIT has a program for undergraduates to um, come and do research at faculty members groups. And so I have this group around scalable machine learning and data analytics. Um, but another faculty member has a group around databases and large scale databases. And another faculty member has uh, you know, uh, a group around visualizations and human computer interfaces. And so some of the students choose to go to each one of us. right? And by the time they finish, they've picked up a background in all three areas. Uh, when they come within my group, uh, we have different flows because we don't just work in the MOOC domain. We also look at medical data. Um, we've been looking at the waveforms that are captured when a person's blood pressure is actually monitored. Um, we've also been looking at text and we've been looking at website hits. So we have a, uh, an array of data and what we do is we build stacks technology stacks and our students get to help at different parts of the technology stack and at the, at, the, at, the far, at the low end of the stack it's where the data comes in and we have to understand how to clean it, make sure it's valid, uh, structure it in something like MoodDB and we do that in more domains than just this. Um, and then we actually look at more advanced things like uh, coming up with features and, and building out these sort of scalable machine learning platforms. So a student can stay with us for a couple years sometimes and move around the different projects uh, to get the experience they want. Cool. Um, so um, another question, which um, I think you, you alluded to, but um, is this idea that you had the luxury to build an information model from scratch. Obviously, the rest of us don't have that and we have to kind of gobble things up. Are there insights from that exercise that are valuable for um, basically us, organizations and, and, and institutions that are looking at legacy information model and thinking about how to think about it more collaboratively open and so on? Yeah, I think the institutions face both the, um, a legacy issue and I think they face that control issue we're talking about. And the question is whether it's feasible in some situations to build that unifying information model. Right? You build it on top of what you have. Um, and uh, what we've, the policy we've fig followed is that we don't put anything in that information model that we don't need. So we're completely requirements driven by a particular project that we're trying to uh, run. Right? And, and our goals tell us we don't actually design those information models theoretically. Right, to, for any situation. We start by the particular situation we're interested in and build them out like that. Yeah, okay. That's actually helpful because it's sort of saying find those use cases, solve for that end to end, and then uh, move on from there. That's right. And I think sometimes those use cases and the end to end solution, the first ones aren't even large scale. Right? They can be quite modest. But once you have something end to end, you can then analyze where your bottlenecks are and where the challenges are, and it's, then, you, then you sort of go at those components. But it's very hard to predict when you have to build an integration to insight system where the bottleneck is going to be or where the, the gap is going to be, right? So we, um, our philosophy is definitely uh, to build at, at small scale end to end first. And something like this, um, like for the MOOC, <clears throat> the people that typically look at learning styles are probably not necessarily doing that kind of analysis with that scale of data. Have you seen some, um, how have they adapted? Right. So it's very interesting. I don't know that much about learning, right? I'm a data, uh, I'm a data analyst. I mean, I actually do instruct. But really, the trifecta of uh, uh, insights are going to, the trifecta to get good insights is going to be an instructor, a learning scientist, and a, and a data analyst. And um, so we have teamed up. At MIT, there is a teaching and learning lab. And they, have been, they were the first people to actually look at this data. And when we went over there and started looking at the data as the computer scientists, they were struggling. They were just dying in this low-level data because they didn't know anything about an information model. So that was their first hurdle. And I think that was a motivation for us creating the information model and making it public and bringing the software out. Um, but there's been, there's been another development, which is 
they are hypothesis driven, not data driven, right? So they go out there and they have theories of learning and they want to see whether those theories of learning are confirmed by their data. And one of their, one of their uh, projects was to go look at social support. And therefore they wanted to look at the forums and they wanted to look through these discussions. Well, there was 90,000 uh, threads. Right? There was 90,000 posts, 12,000 threads. They started combing these things to try and look at them. And they came up with a protocol for labeling the role of, the, of this poster and for um, labeling the topic. And they trained to graduate students and they managed to like get 4,500 of these posts done. But when they connected to us, we were like, oh, we know when you have those labels, we know how to use supervised machine learning and we can build you a system that will label for you. And that was just this wonderful synergy because I wanted to meet these people, right? I really did, I was really interested in the questions they had. And some of the most interesting things that happen, and I, they may happen with you too, is it's when hypothesis driven expertise and knowledge hits with the data driven uh, um, perspective, which is I'll, I'll find what's there versus I know what I'm looking for. And we have these incredibly uh, difficult friction, highly friction uh, conversations with them sometimes because they can't believe we're just trolling. <laughs> right? But they're like, oh, no, no, we have a theory. And we're like, well, we'll tell you what the data says, and then you can compare it to your theory. And that's actually philosophically and intellectually a little bit at odds. But it's really, I think it's, um, when you're doing that and you're having those conversations and you're really getting at your data. Well, thank you for joining us and thank you, uh, Uname, for sharing your groundbreaking work w for, with us. That was fascinating and obviously applicable to many of us. So I uh, hope to see you guys at the next event. It'll be May 13th, hopefully a little warmer than today. And uh, we'll be welcoming Ben Fry to talk about data visualization. Thank you. Thank you.